Thank you for tuning in to Market for Material Value. We're Valentina Carga and Peter Jan Grandry, and today we're in call with Max Haven, who is an assistant professor at the Nova Scotia College for Art and Design in Canada. And he's author of books that uh, talk about the financialization of society and culture, such as The Crisis of Imagination and Crisis of Power, and the cultures of financialization uh, that have helped us a lot with our research so far. So Max, we're very happy that you took time to, to talk with us because I'm reading your books and, it, <laughs> and it's a very helpful uh, f a way for, for us to understand some things about uh, financing, financialization. First of all, which is actually a very complex uh, topic, and you have a very good way of breaking it down in a simple Perfect. language, so that you know actually everybody can understand this this complex uh, concept. Uh, I would like uh, perhaps to uh, to let you introduce a little bit this idea of financialization and what what do you mean uh, when you write in your book that. Um, Financialization is not something that is imposed to us from from the top, but is something that we generate through yes. through daily life, actually, you know, and through the transformation of all aspects of our lives, like economy and politics and culture and everything. And and also, if you if you imagine any way out of it, or if you see any examples that move in a direction that is away from this logic. Uh, yeah, so um, most of the time when people talk about financialization, they limit themselves to talking about just the economic sphere. Mm -hmm. uh, and usually by that they mean the expansion of the so-called fire sector, uh, finance, insurance, and real estate. Mm -hmm. uh, so that looks like the incredible power of um, investment banks, hedge funds, uh private equity firms and other financial institutions over the global economy, the rise of derivative trading and other global networked forms of uh, finance that basically have meant that both within most countries and also globally, the share of global wealth production by the financial sector has just sort of ballooned in the last 30 years. They also talk about financialization in terms of the rise of new technologies of uh, creating new financial products, high-frequency trading through computerized uh, networks, uh, and generally the way that almost every institution of the capitalist economy has been reoriented towards speculative economic growth, uh, away from you know a primacy on production of actual commodities, away from even uh, you know the production of services, and towards sort of weird financial games that allow you to create speculative money basically creating money out of money out of money. Mm -hmm. That's an important way to understand financialization, uh, but it's not the only way. And I've argued and others have argued that we need to understand it in a number of other dimensions too. So one of the other dimensions that tends to get talked about is the way that financialization affects uh, politics and political economy, such that now national governments and transnational institutions are increasingly beholden to uh, expediting and accelerating financial flows. Partly this is due to the fact that most governments are deeply in debt to financial markets and therefore financial markets have an incredible disciplinary power over state policy. Mm -hmm. And that disciplinary power over policy extends not only to sort of the nation state but downwards to different states and provinces within countries. Uh, here in North America, it extends to universities. In the United States, it extends to even public school boards, cities. All sorts of political actors are increasingly in the, uh, you know, beholden to the financial sector. And that's not even to get into uh, the incredible lobbying power the financial sector has, uh, and also the fact that the, the financial sector has become so complex that usually the only people who can be uh, relied upon to understand it and therefore regulate it are people who come from the financial sector itself. Mm -hmm. So you have this sort of uh, integration of the financial sector with politics. Uh, and that's 
that's all fine and good, uh, but those two definitions of what financialization is would lead us to believe that it is this totally top-down dystopian imposition of this sort of alien system. And I think for a number of reasons that's untrue. It's very comforting and tempting to imagine that financialization is something new and something totally sort of alien to capitalist accumulation. But actually, if we look at the whole history of capitalism since the birth of the system uh, in Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries, right up until the present day, finance has always been an integral part of capitalist accumulation and capitalist exploitation. And at various moments in capitalist development, it becomes ascendant or dominant or hegemonic over other aspects of capitalism. But we can't separate them out. Um, so in addition to this economic and political landscape, we also have to look at a social and cultural landscape as well that's very much activated by people. In the social realm, we can look at the way that, for instance, except in a n number of jurisdictions where people have maintained it as a public good, uh, university education has been financialized in the sense that in North America, in the UK, and other many other sectors, it's become a commodity to be bought and sold. And students are increasingly encouraged to understand their relationship to education as a quote-unquote investment in their own personalized, individualized futures. Uh, and indeed, we've seen the expansion of just that word investment into practically every sphere of social life, certainly into housing and shelter. But increasingly, we've seen it enter into, for instance, the uh, provision of charity or social aid in various forms. There's been the rise of social impact investing, which basically understands um, providing assistance to people in need in our communities as a quote-unquote investment aimed at making them market-ready or improving their human capital. Uh, this language of investment has become a sort of useful discursive tool in all sorts of spheres of life, including in the fine arts, uh, where increasingly art schools are seen as places to invest students with certain types of dispositions or skills that they can later trade in on markets. And art itself has been seen increasingly as an investment in creating certain other effects out there in the economy and society. For instance, the discourse of the creative city is all about sort of leveraging art and culture as a uh, instrument, as an investment to create certain effects. Mm -hmm. So throughout society, we've seen the expansion of uh, finance as a discursive tool for understanding social affairs. And this has led, I think, to a deeper cultural shift towards a sort of neoliberal individualization in almost every sphere of activity in life, where individuals increasingly are encouraged to shape themselves as subjects in the image of the financier, where we're all supposed to understand ourselves and all our relationships as assets to be leveraged, as containers of human capital to be tapped uh, as sites of investment. Um, this is happening all over the place. We can see it reflected in popular culture. We can see it reflected in education, even of children uh, within primary and secondary schools who are increasingly asked to speculate on their own futures. Uh, and I think the sum total of all of these effects of financialization is that rather than just seeing financialization as sort of an aberration or a mistake that's been made in capitalist accumulation, we should really see it as yet another tool uh, that capitalism uses to take control over social reproduction. Uh, the temptation for a lot of political economists is to say the problem with financialization is that it's uh, fictitious capital that it's, you know, good capitalism or capitalism that works, whether we agree with capitalism or not, is capitalism, uh, capital that goes into producing hard and fast assets, into producing actual things, into harnessing the power of workers mm -hmm. and producing commodities. And what financialization does is distract or um, uh, derail capitalism from this task and instead sort of force capitalism into producing these immaterial assets like de derivatives, credit default swaps. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it creates all of these crises within capitalist accumulation uh, of financialization. That's true, but I think we should also see financialization as, the, as one of the means by which capitalism develops and coordinates a whole range of interventions in the field of social reproduction, by which I mean the production of social life, the production of, social, of subjectivities, the production of uh, social spaces. Uh, financialization, when we look at it in this expanded view, appears as a 
much more complicated, sophisticated, and unfortunately ground up process where we are, each of us, encouraged to do the work of financialization in our own lives, in our own communities, in our own uh, social institutions, and through that, introduce financialization to ever more spheres of social life. Yeah. So actually, uh, yeah, we totally agree with you. And um, for our project, we really reflect a lot on what, how this affects our ourselves, first of all, as Per, as persons, but also as, as artists, you know, what does this does to us? And uh, like how I understand that there is a, a link between financialization and precarity as well. And, uh, and I feel that we creative, uh, precarious people are forced to, to invest our own selves as our own uh, as assets, basically because we don't have anything else to play on this financial market apart from ourselves and our work and our uh, human and intellectual capital. So then this becomes the very uh, um, speculative object that we are trading in a way. And this is extremely alienating. You know, it feels that we don't have control uh, out of this and we are investing so much while we, we don't know if we will ever get anything back. Like, it's really, again, this uh, mechanism of gambling, like it happens with, uh, um, yeah, uh, with the assets on the financial market, anyway, happens in, to our own lives. And that's why uh, we, we have produced a culture which is a lot about performance. Like, it feels that we are constantly performing ourselves instead of just simply being ourselves. And also, like, there is also this idea of, ah, oh, I want to make money from uh, who I am and what I do and not to work for other people and so on. But, like, who do, who do we really are or what do we really do? That's also a huge question that we have to, to start analyzing, I think. And on what kind of uh, context and economy we want to, to, to make a living out of. <coughs> So, um, so we're thinking of this um, art project, basically, which includes its own economic mechanism of, you know, making money to, to cover its own costs and our labor uh, <coughs> through the very um, concept of it. But you will tell me, okay, that's also what Jeff Koons does, you know, like it's the same idea in yeah. a way, but we want to do it... Uh, through a different um, ethic, you know, like if Jeff Koons really copies and studies very well how the financial market and, uh, and uh, um, works uh, and speculation and so on, we want to do it through a, maybe a sharing economy model. So that's that's our question. Like, can we, is it even possible to create like a sharing economy version of an art market? Or, or like a, a peer-to-peer -peer version or like an open source uh, model through using internet and user-based value and all these sort of tools that we now have and it's actually open to all of, to all of us for use in a way. Um, do you understand what I mean? It's still very broad yeah. and open. <coughs> the idea would be like a little bit more... Uh practical to create some kind of a network where you where you post alternative um, alternative art markets let's say so we have like a lottery we have uh, a thing where we divide up an artwork into shares where people can buy this this own of uh, proof of ownership but without actually owning it so that the artist can have money from different ways but within all these kind of little systems we want to incorporate this kind of way that you can't you, you want to get paid for a basic amount, but not this huge surplus extra. So that it's somehow... That some artists do make in, in this kind yeah. of speculative art market. And that as soon as this could happen, that we have a system that gives it, that spreads it within the network, that less, yeah, that less uh, sellable artists still get a piece of the one that has been selling more. So more, more like a co cooperative uh, sort of model. That's what we are thinking of. But still, the mechanisms we we end up thinking are, are again shares, lottery, you know, tickets, things like that. 
because we uh, also what Peter uh, in addition to what Peter said is that we do want to use somehow money because we believe that is important like if we, if we still live in a world that the 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 rule of exchange is uh, is our basis then not to make money just adds to our misery and precarity and so on and we don't want to do that so we want to to pay back the artists and ourselves and the people who are involved in the cultural pr production for for their work and not just work for free but uh, maybe through a way that takes away th takes away the focus from money like we had a conversation last week with joe who is one of the founders of couchsurfing and he said that in couchsurfing, actually, there is money involved because people give donations and maybe they generate something like six million mm -hmm. per year from this. But but the focus is not on the money; is on the on experience and, and exchange and sharing and so on. So it, it's not a, it's wrong to think that if there is a, you know nothing to be sold, there is no money involved. So we were thinking, how can we transfer this kind of um, values. value to to something that still, you know, generates money in a way, but takes away the focus from the money? And then this is actually a little bit what you're saying to t to turn the imagination not to work only, you know, to the imagination of people that is not only about the money. Mm. It's a very uh, yeah. difficult line to walk I yeah. think, if yeah. you said yourselves um, so this would be a, uh, you, where would the money in the end come from this would be you're thinking about a platform that would sell physical works of art uh, to collectors uh, like the, the typical art markets and then somehow redistribute the money amidst some sort of network or collective of, of artists? Would that be the general scheme? That would be one way to go, but we actually wanted to open the possibility for everybody to collect art so that we could sell tickets, for example, to <clears throat> extremely low, low amounts, like one euro or something, to everybody who could afford one euro. And then in the end, uh, one of these, or maybe some of these people, if it's like a work that can be in copies, will will get uh, the actual, the physical work. Uh, but maybe then everybody could get a share of this work, so that they they get then the material, you know, value of participating in it in a way, mm -hmm. and adding adding um, yeah adding value to it by by participating in this platform somehow so we want the validation of you know why is this a good piece of art to come from from the people who, who like and support it and not you know from because usually in the art market is also very elitistic there is the alpha consumers who dictate the prices and we say okay him i like i will invest in it I will put him in exhibitions with other big names and then he will make he will become a name and I will get my investment back like ten times more you know it's like yeah. that that's usually how it goes so we want uh, we want to to take this element away and we say okay people who like this work can actually invest with very low amounts in this work and then they, that will help to validate this particular artist we are promoting this time or this network of artists. Uh, but then actually maybe just uh, one person will have the chance to win the work. But it's maybe a little bit more democratic because that could be anybody. It could also be a student who can own then this piece of work and not a collector. Yeah. And the, the price, let's say, of the, of the finished work, how much the artist will get will be... Uh, depending on how many people buy a ticket, so if it's mm. if it's uh, appreciated by a large amount of people, then his monetary reward will be bigger. But somehow, we we I mean I I don't know if it will happen, but just in a theoretic case, if someone suddenly sells a million tickets, he has a million euros. That we don't that we don't suddenly have this one guy with a million euros, but that we still just give him a thousand euros or two thousand or three thousand euros, what we think is fair, what he thinks is fair, and that we somehow redistribute this other 
uh, amount of money into other projects which maybe don't sell a lot of tickets. If in any case this project and platform becomes so successful <laughs> and generates so much money, yeah. may, probably it won't for at least for a, not for a long time. But maybe, we don't know, you know, like we just want to also have a, a backup solution for what happens if it su suddenly becomes successful in monetary terms and that, that it does not become this most monster that turns it, you know, totally the other way around and ends up being something opposite to what we wanted to do. Right. No, I mean, I think that that could be very useful for a lot of artists I think like like a lot of crowdsourcing and crowdfunding it would largely rely upon the strength of the networks of the artists themselves or the networks that you guys would build as facilitators of yeah. it I, yeah. the, the research that I've looked at on crowdfunding would seem to indicate that it's often quite difficult to break out of those networks mm -hmm. um so but i think that the the elegance of the solution that you're proposing is that it really does tap into those networks where there isn't a lot of capital uh so people can make very small gambles or small bets or small investments mm -hmm. the thing i would wonder is if there's a way to envision such a project like I think there are sort of two prod, sort of two orientations to the to these sorts of projects like yours, and one of them is to see them as a form of economic self defense against financialized capitalism, mm -hmm. where you are basically putting into place a means by which cultural producers and the precariat can uh, gain, regain some level of stability, or the, let's call it them the means of social reproduction. From, from capital mm -hmm. uh, in a moment of incredible constraint and crisis. Um, and then, and these two don't need to be separate, but in addition to the forms of economic self-defense, then there's the question of uh, forms of creation. Uh, so could this project be a platform for people to create new relationships, new subjectivities, new forms of cooperation outside of the capitalist economy? Uh, and not every project needs to do both. But I wonder, I can understand this project as a form of economic self-defense in the sense that it would allow people who wish to purchase art a chance to get very nice pieces uh, for an extremely small investment. And I can understand it as economic self-defense for the, um, the artists themselves who would then, you know, be probably get, actually reduce the risk in some ways of their own creative gamble by exposing that risk to a much broader uh, constituency of clients. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that, that makes sense to me. But then is there an element of it that's also about trying to forge new relationships or new forms of sociality or new forms of solidarity? Uh, and I think I hear that in this idea that a certain amount of the, the proceeds of such a scheme would go towards some sort of common fund, which could then do various things, uh, either distributed out amongst the broader spectrum of artists whose work doesn't sell as well, or perhaps create common institutions uh, for those artists. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's very interesting. And actually, what we're thinking next to it is also like a physical version of this market in physical, intangible space where, you know, like, for instance, now we have the possibility to present something at Transmediale next uh, year. So there, uh, I think what we are working out to propose would be like kind of a, a, a summit or a shareholders or invest, investors meeting where, you know, the people who actually bought sh shares or, or tickets or whatever we decide to call it, uh, of this artwork that we auction then can also meet in physical space and can discuss about you know all this problematic that we're actually it's actually only in our head but I'm sure that everybody like lots of people especially people in the art world are thinking about this yeah. and I think you know it's, it's very hard to think of how we could do this in a bigger scale online using the actual online platform 
But what we could do at least for now is to really facilitate these kind of meetings in physical space, maybe with a s smaller amount of people. Uh, but, you know, there is a little bit this contradiction between the platform we're building that has maybe, we're aiming to have really a lot of um, pe participants or uh, how to users, and then the, the actual physical events that, you know, maybe the max we can host there is like a thousand people or so. so right, right. You know, like how can you compensate for... For the, the bigger scale is a, is an actual problem we have because actually, for instance, if we go back to couch surfing, what happens there is that in, indeed it is a place to to practice new new socialities, but it's a, it happens always between two you know like a, a smaller circle of people, and and it's not about creating all these infinite potentials of you know. <laughs> having experiences with everybody but you know if only two people of the platform meet and they have a, an exchange is already successful so maybe with that logic a little bit we're going into okay maybe the small scale is not a bad um, idea actually yeah. have you guys um, talked with or heard of Caroline Willard no she is a pretty phenomenal New York-based artist, um, How, and she specializes yeah. in creating, you, through her art practice, is creating solidarity economies. Mm. So she'd be very interested to talk to you about this, I think. Okay. For instance, um, and, and she does a lot of really interesting work integrating online and offline mm. community building. Mm -hmm. So one of her projects that and she always works in collaboration with others, designers, web programmers, researchers. One of her projects is called Trade School, which is basically an online platform that allows local communities to trade skills. So you offer basically a class on whatever you want to teach. Mm -hmm. I've taught more sort of theoretical classes when I've done it in our trade school here in Halifax, uh, but other people teach cooking classes, massage classes, building classes, what, whatever, but you're not allowed to ask for any form of monetary compensation, yeah. but you are compelled to ask for some form of barter, so you have to ask for goods or services or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the nice thing about that platform is it's, it's one that is coordinated online but lived in person. And she has another platform that she helped build called Our Goods, which was is basically a barter network in Brooklyn, where you can post the thing that you want to uh, trade on this platform, and then you can link up with other people and get the thing that you want out of it. And she's right now working to build a, um, I think, a community land trust or a, a artist's cooperative to try and seize back some of the city from gentrification. But she's a really interesting artist who I think has thought through a lot of these questions about like, how do you use new technologies um, to create a solidarity economy yeah. among very particular groups of people uh, struggling under certain similar conditions of precariousness. Yeah. Um, so she's super interesting. And the other thing that the project reminds me of a bit is the uh, Robin Hood Minor Asset Management. Yeah, yeah the, that we know. <laughs> yeah. We haven't talked uh, yet to them, but uh, we would actually really much like to get in touch. And uh, I, li I like a lot their concept. It's basically... Mm -hmm. But actually what they do is that they really study very well and they know very well how the financial market works. But they yeah. say... We know we have this knowledge and we make it work for us and our, you know. Uh, so it's about uh, about leveling in this inequality creating created from the financial world a little bit. Yeah, what what bugs bugs me now a little bit still in our project is that it's 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 just like Kickstarter and crowdfunding that it relies on the the, the the poor man, let's say, to give another euro for another project. Well, there is so much money. For these few people that can just, I mean, mm. yeah, donate is much, much easier. I, I feel a bit guilty to ask again for money or to ask again for some for something. Or for uh, for participation yeah. even, you know, because actually that's even worse than asking money in a way. 
if because it's more engaging you know to ask maybe a euro is um, in some cases can be less um, yeah yeah so it's I, a problem yeah, yeah it's a problem do you also find problematic uh, in crowdfunding or in our model as well this aspect of participation of people yeah yeah and I would say that right now there's a bit of a gold rush on for the sharing economy and mm -hmm. finding means to financialize it, um, which is very, uh, in some ways it opens up a lot of opportunities for new platforms and in other ways it presents a lot of risks of co-optation. And that's why I, mm -hmm. I, I try and make that distinction between uh, self-defensive maneuvers and creative maneuvers because... You know, this scheme, there is a way that you could think of means to get major art collectors or even uh, very famous artists to mm -hmm. buy into it or to sort of give give to it as a form of philanthropy or mm -hmm. what we, you know, gets called philanthrocapitalism, where, you know, all solutions to social problems can be solved by the market as long as there are enlightened capitalists out there to make the right investments. This is, for instance, the uh, philosophy behind the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which is now the largest charity in the world. Um, and the, you know, in the balance, it's a hard thing to weigh because, of course, we want this money and we want this money to go to people who need it. But we also have to, of course, be very aware of what we're giving. So I can imagine a scheme like this. There are a number of people within the art world who might be excited about it. But then the question is, what, what, what sorts of capital are they accruing uh, from giving? They might be giving up their monetary capital, but they're getting some form of cultural capital or some form of uh, social capital or some form of critical capital within the art world. I mean, I think it's interesting to look at how successful relational aesthetics or social practice art has been over the last 20 years. And now there's an, uh, almost an acceleration of investment in these practices yeah. because uh, to a large extent, the sort of art world insiders are so hungry for an art an outside to bring inwards, a, a new terrain to colonize, essentially. And I think this is also happening on the sort of art world side of the sharing economy and uh, new platforms. There's a certain sense that there's a, there's a keen interest in it by museums, by collectors, by art world insiders, whatever that means. I mean, the inside and the outside of the art world mm -hmm. are very amorphous. But I would just, uh, I think that, there's a way that it's, from my perspective, it's always worth keeping an eye on how such a project can move artists and other people towards a position of power and autonomy from capital. Uh, because there are lots of ways of carving out a space within capital, and some of them are more successful and some of them are less successful. But I think we can, uh, we can sort of assess the success of such projects on if they make it possible for us to exit the relations mm -hmm. of exploitation and dependency. Yeah. And I don't know, I don't necessarily know what that looks like for Caroline Willard. I mean, she's really interested in providing spaces for artists and others to exist outside of the monetary economy. Yeah. She wants to really create places where people no longer feel the discipline of money. Um, and sometimes that requires using money in very strategic ways but it's always based on this idea that, that we won't. And then for the Robin Hood project, I mean, they have the primary focus of their project is creating this venue by which, you know, the precariat, as they put it, can access financial markets uh, and access financial accelerationism. Um, but they also, part of that money that they bring in, they're also putting towards a, a pool for commons projects, yeah. which at least allegedly, I don't, you know, the proof will be in, in time, we'll see, but allegedly work towards creating infrastructures where people can exit the capitalist economy yeah. in some meaningful way. Yeah. So it's this balance always between, uh, you know, participation and exit that is very, that's, I think, very difficult line to walk. Yeah. 
And actually, uh, I come from a little bit this background of, of socially engaged art. And I've done previous projects like the Summer School for Applied Autonomy, which mm -hmm. was a little bit such a place where, where we actually constructed a, a machine that could allow you to produce everything you needed to survive. So we had like uh, we had built uh, our own tiny architecture, um, photovoltaics, gardens, uh, compost toilets, you know, like um, biogas, biogas digesters, and so on. All with like YouTube open source knowledge, and um, and it was kind of a, an exercise on on a less alienating life, you know, like when you don't have this mediation, this detour, you know, of the mediation of money, but you rather work directly on producing your own food, or also working directly on on uh, producing your own uh, network of exchange, because of course you cannot produce everything that you need to survive, but you might produce something surplus, and then you can exchange it with others and so on. Mm. And, and that, I think it was this kind of space w that al allowed you to, to exit, kind of, mm. kind of exit capitalism, but it was still created under these very particular circumstances of cultural funding as well, you know, so like, it's very interesting, uh, like, I think art occupies a very interesting space between fiction and reality in what terms of, of what it imagines and what it actually da does, you know? And I think it, it's, um, it's interesting when you put people on this level of thinking, you know, that this is, is reality while actually it's not. But I think to, to, cha to start changing our imagination is very That's important. Very to, to, to participate and produce such spaces and experiments, uh, even if they are still very small. And I guess the only thing I would add, and I, I hesitate to say it because it's something I'm thinking through and, and working on now, but I'll, I'll phrase it as a question, and mm -hmm. it's a question I'm asking myself, and I think I'd be interested to see if it resonates with you. There's... So I would categorize, you know, at least one dimension of your project as trying to build some form of commons. Um, yeah. And I don't know if you adopt that language or not, but that's the yeah, language yeah. that I'm familiar with thinking about. They're basically forms of self-sufficiency, autonomy, and uh, community empowerment Absolutely. within mm -hmm. and against uh, the sort of structures of capitalist accumulation. The temptation for those of us who are creating commons is always to base them on positive affect, mm -hmm. uh, which is to say we want them to be beautiful and empowering and uh, democratic and healthy and prefigurative and happy. Mm -hmm. I'm increasingly interested in commons that are based on negative affect, <laughs> like revenge, or like um, parasitism, or like theft, or this is one of the things that attracts me to um, the Robin Hood platform in some ways. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. framed in part as a positive commons, but also as a negative commons. And by negative, I don't just mean like bad. I also mean negativity in the Frankfurt School sense of something that negates. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wonder if there's a way that this project might also not only think through the positive things and the happy things and the nice things about building a commons, but also the negative affect, the negativity, in the sense that does this project have an enemy? And who is that enemy? And how can it undermine or hurt or um, otherwise trouble that enemy. No. Um, because I think in the financialized capitalist economy, we're not all friends. Um, mm. And the philanthropic capitalists want everyone to be friends. They yeah. want us all to like get together in a big circle and they'll give us money and we'll thank <laughs> them and they'll create something beautiful and then they'll go away and everyone will just like smile and drink <laughs> champagne on their yachts and we'll drink cheap beer in our apartments and you know, <laughs> it's just what will happen but I think maybe there's a way to introduce and maybe one of the ways to break through the impasse is to is to also think about like the bad stuff 
the mean stuff, the like the stuff that we're kind of uncomfortable thinking about. Um, that's where I'm at. And I, again, I say this with a great deal of trepidation and self-criticism and self-questioning. But I, I don't know. That's what I'm thinking about these days. 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 About these days.